In the last two centuries, the changes Japanese society has gone through have been monumental. From a feudal society plunged into civil war and closed off from the rest of the world, to one of the most technologically advanced countries and a top travel destination. It has fascinated the Western imagination since the Perry expedition in the mid-19th century, forced an end to the closed society regime. For over two and a half centuries, Japan had been isolated by strict policies banning the entry of foreigners and the leaving of Japanese with the only contact with the rest of the world coming through Nagasaki, where Chinese and Dutch traders were allowed. Then, in 1853, Commodore Perry's ships arrived on a diplomatic mission to open trade with the USA, and forced an end to this regime. Half a century later, in the early 1900s, we see a great deal of Japanese influence in the West. The Geisha was a popular Edwardian musical comedy, and if you look through photos of popular models and actresses at that time, and even paintings, you will see many of the women are wearing kimono. The rest of the world was desperate for anything Japanese – clothes, furniture, accessories, and the very culture itself. Among all the appreciation and appropriation, we find one Japanese woman gaining immense popularity – Sada Yako. The Japan Sada was born into on the 18th of July 1871 was a country undergoing immense change. It was nearly two decades on from the opening up to commerce with America and by extension the rest of the world, and an influx of Western culture was taking the once feudal society by storm. Western fashions took on in the upper classes, with women leaving the comfort of their kimonos for the fashionable corsets and bustles. Men began to don Western styles as well, with suits and bowler hats becoming commonplace. And yet, Japan was by no means losing its own cultural identity. The many foreigners who had flocked to this exotic land were fascinated by Japanese customs, and while it was not a perfect integration of two distinctly different cultures, with the opening up of Japan we see one of those rare examples of mutual appreciation. As Sada Yako grew up, she was influenced not only by the changing styles of the country, but its attitudes as well. She wore Western clothing and learned how to read and write, a rarity for Japanese women at the time. She was intelligent and an accomplished horsewoman. She was the twelfth child to be born to her impoverished parents. The shogunate that had ruled Japan for the last two centuries had imposed a rigid class system. This was one of the causes of their downfall. One's position in this system depended upon what you and historically your family gave to the country. Merchants were considered among the lowest classes, below even peasants who at least produced goods, while the merchants only sold them. And while many of them were wealthy, their social status would never go up. By the 19th century, the highest class of samurai military, the class Sada's family belonged to, relied almost entirely on their ancestors' victories, and most only wore their swords for show, having no clue how to use them. After the fall of the shogunate, things changed. Money began to matter more than class, and Sada's family was thrown into poverty. As young as four, she was being sent to work as a maid for the geisha house or okia, where she would eventually become a renowned geisha. The selling of children was officially illegal, but it was common to say one had borrowed some money from establishments such as Okia's in exchange for your child moving there. The slim hope she might be able to return to her family died with her father when she was seven, and Sada was adopted by the proprietor of the Hamada Okia in Tokyo, Kamikichi. This adoption ensured Sada would not receive the same treatment other young girls sent off to be maids would. They were little more than indentured servants, and could be beaten and mistreated. But Sada would begin her training for the life of a geisha, and to hit an apprentice would risk doing harm to her body or disfiguring her so she could not work. Despite the epitome of feminine grace she would become, as a child she was a tomboy. She wore boys' kimonos and ran wild, climbing trees and exploring ruins. She would never completely lose her wild streak, but soon she began to channel her passionate nature into mastering the arts of dance, music, etiquette, flower arranging, calligraphy, and many more. This takes years of practice, and that is why it was common for girls as young as five or six to begin their training. A geisha must be effortlessly witty and entertaining. The art of conversation is the one skill that cannot be fully taught, and it is a vital component to success. Sada Yako was taught reading and writing, judo, and even horse riding. The sight of Western women on horseback had shocked the Japanese, as only samurai rode them, and it would have been unthinkable for women to do so. 
but it slowly became a fashionable, if rare, sight. Sada even took part in racing at one point. All these extra skills made her stand out from the crowd and attract high-class customers. It is a misconception that geisha are courtesans, and while relationships between geisha and clients do happen, and in Sada's time it was normal for powerful men to take them as mistresses and even wives, it is not part of their job. Geisha entertain women and families too, although in those days wives were expected to remain at home and rarely accompanied their husbands to events. Wives were supposed to be serious, quiet and submissive. They didn't flirt or make witty conversation. It was the job of Geisha to be entertaining company. Sada mastered all the necessary skills, but her true passion was in dance. Japanese traditional dance is much slower and more subtle than Western dances. The intricacies of the movements and the storytelling one must do with them makes it harder to learn than one would think. Many of a geisha's routines are taken from kapuki theatre, one of the two main traditional forms of theatre in Japan. No drama has its origins in the imperial court and religious ritual, whereas kapuki was created for the common people and is livelier. Theatre would play a major role in Sada's life in the years to come, taking her further than she could have dreamed as a child. At the age of nine, Sada began attending banquets, where she played music on drums and charmingly talked as she poured the client's drinks. This was not an unusual age for girls trained to be geisha to begin working in those days. Around this time, she met Count Hirobumi Ito, one of the most powerful men in the country and a regular patron of the Hamada House. He would become Japan's first prime minister a few years later and had already taken a shine to the spirited Sada. In 1883, at the age of 12, she debuted as an apprentice geisha. Her popularity was already rising, and by 14, she was the best-known geisha in Tokyo. One day, while out riding, she was surrounded by a pack of angry dogs, frightening her horse. A young man called Momosuke Fukuzawa helped her, and they soon became friends. Momosuke would go on to introduce hydroelectricity to Japan, and be nicknamed the Wizard of the Money Markets, as he was very financially successful. Sada had to focus on her work, and she and Momosuke, after enjoying a brief friendship, would not meet again until the 20th century. When she turned 15, it was time for her Mizuage ceremony. Mizuage is a coming-of-age ceremony that high-class courtesans called Oiran underwent when they were ready for business, so to speak. On occasion it happened to Maiko, apprentice geisha as well, but it was not a necessary part of them graduating to full geisha status. It is the selling of the girl's virginity to the highest bidder among her patrons. Count Ito, now Prime Minister, bought Sada's for a record high price. She continued to be his mistress for three years, during which time her popularity soared thanks to this connection. Through Ito, she would meet a man named Otojiro Kawakami, who would drastically change her life. He called himself the Liberty Kid. He and his acting troupe thrilled audiences with their plays, satirising the well-known events of the day. Like Sada, he was from a poor background and had lost a parent. In Japan, second sons got nothing, and he was the second son of a second son. His mother died when he was 11, and he didn't like his stepmother, so he stowed away on a cargo ship going to Osaka. After that, his life was filled with struggle and adventure. At 18, he became a policeman in Kyoto, and then he joined the Liberal Party and became a political agitator. He bragged his speeches, got him arrested 180 times. During this time, Western theatre was growing in popularity in Japan. Western plays were performed in Japanese, and were found to have more realism than the traditional dramas. Otojiro's radical friends saw an opportunity to further their ideas through entertainment, and so he formed an acting troupe. The audience was simply another rabble to rouse, and the satirical plays were his passionate speeches. His troupe created a play based upon the assassination attempt of the founder of Japan's Liberal Party, Itagaki Daisuke. At the end of this play, a humorous song was performed that became known as the Opakepe song for its chorus that mimicked the sound of a trumpet. The lyrics mock rich men with their expensive watches and top hats, spending their time and money on geisha and other entertainments. Sadayako's patron, Prime Minister Ito, ironically was impressed with the troupe and invited them to perform for him at a private party. It was there that Otojiro and Sadayako first met. Sada was instantly attracted to Otojiro's powerful presence. He was a man who knew what he wanted and was a talented and passionate performer. 
her relationship with Count Ito was helpful to her career. But Sada also took other lovers, usually celebrities like sumo wrestlers and kabuki actors. But after meeting Otojiro, she committed herself fully to him, determined that she would support his career and devote herself to improving him. She used her connections to his advantage and supported him financially through her work as a geisha. At first, she was mercilessly mocked for this relationship due to the pair's fame. Geisha are only a little higher than kabuki actors in the social standing, but in traditional theatre you might come from an esteemed acting family. Otojiro, however, was among the lowest classes, and many thought him an unsuitable match for Sada. But she was determined to make a better man of him, and the objections of others only made her more ambitious. She went as far as to give money and gifts given to her by patrons and lovers to Otojiro. On one occasion, she presented him with two rings which had their names inscribed. The press and society continued to mock Sada's besotted behaviour, but nothing could stop the celebrity couple. They married in 1893, and Sada continued to work as a geisha, as Otojiro was frequently in need of her financial support and connections. She took out a loan for a substantial amount of money for a theatre Otojiro wanted to create. It ended up being a financial failure, and the mountain of debt grew too high for them to pay off. He tried to run for political office and borrowed more money. His expensive but disastrous campaign failed, and the creditors were hammering down his door for money. Otojiro frequently did eccentric things and even disappeared, leaving the troop and his wife to sort things out for him. One day, a man brandishing a sword burst into Sada's house. He had vouched for Otojiro's debts, and now he had disappeared, leaving the man in real financial trouble. But still, Sada remained a tireless and faithful wife. One day, a woman with a baby arrived at the house. The woman claimed the child was Otojiro's, and he had promised that should they ever need it, they were welcome in his house. This was too much for Sada, who flew into a rage at the brazen insult of this woman barging into her home. In Japan until recent decades, marriages were business-like affairs and were made for advantageous reasons. Faithfulness to one's wife was not expected and mistresses were the norm. However, for a mistress to arrive and make demands to the wife was still humiliating. Sada eventually told her adoptive mother what had happened and she also railed at Totojiro. Only when confronted by both furious women did he seem humbled, but he was still not completely apologetic. Sada then did the unthinkable. In those times, a woman's hair was her glory and pride, and Sada's went all the way down to her waist. She took a pair of scissors and hacked it into a rough bob and declared, I relinquish this marriage, I am no longer your wife. Women couldn't divorce in those days, and so cutting off one's hair and becoming a nun was the only choice she had. Otojiro was stunned and apologised profusely, but Sada wouldn't listen. They were only reconciled when he went down on his hands and knees and begged her forgiveness. They took in his baby son Raikichi, and Otojiro promised that that would be the end of his infidelity. The couple's debts were too large to even hope to pay off. After losing the election, Otojiro had bought a 14-foot-long boat, equipped with a mast oars and a small triangular sail. He had always dreamed of bringing his plays to the West, and now he was embittered and crazed, wanting to turn his back on the world and sail to some faraway land or die at sea trying. Sada said she would go with him, despite the boat being completely open and with no cabin. Japan was not a society with romantic views of couples dying together. If you did that kind of thing, you were seen as an idiot. Nevertheless, they quickly got to work packing provisions, taking their thickest kimono to act as a shelter and gathering maps. They planned to sail to any one of the countries where Otojiro had secured permits to study a few years earlier. But sailing to France, China or America in such a small boat was too far-fetched even for them, so they settled for the Japanese city of Kobe. They took Otojiro's 13-year-old niece Shige and a dog called Fuku with them. To get to Kobe from Tokyo is a long journey that takes you down most of Japan and through rough waters. Two days into sailing, they accidentally dropped anchor at the Yokosuka naval base, where they were detained and advised to give up their plan. Sada's adoptive mother, Kamekichi, hurried down by train to convince Sada not to continue. The travellers were dissuaded from taking Shige and Fuku with them, and Otojiro began to have doubts about the plan himself. Sada, however, was not giving up so easily. 
She declared she would go alone if he didn't want to continue, but he agreed with her and they snuck out of the base one night and set sail. By the time they reached their destination some weeks later, they had been through storms and a typhoon, been attacked by a shoal of angry seals, and their boat had been wedged in rocks, and they were forced to stay on land in a village for a time. Crowds gathered as the exhausted and unhealthy-looking pair finally sailed into Kobe, and Otojiro held a press conference. Members of his acting troupe had come down, and they planned to perform in the neighbouring cities. During the first play, Otojiro collapsed and was rushed to hospital. He had dropsy and anemia. It took six weeks of recovery before he could perform again. Soon his sights were set on travelling to the West. It was a daring and potentially disastrous mission. Otojiro, Sada and his troop all went to San Francisco in 1899, where they had initial success. Sada was surprised to see posters with her face all over the city. In America, she was marketed as an actress, and most of the publicity focused on her. To her shock, she was the main attraction, not her husband, as the Americans were far more interested in actresses, and there was some respect given to performers by the higher classes. The troupe had a Japanese manager who had put them in the best hotel in town, and they were going to perform their play to a mostly Japanese audience. They were successful, and Sada in particular was met with praise, but Otojiro was set on performing for a Western audience. He took the most exciting scenes from famous kabuki plays and put them all together, cutting a lot of dialogue as it was in Japanese, and focused on the dancing, fighting, and humour. Reviews were mixed, but Sada continued to lure in the audience with her exotic performances. Then disaster struck. They had left all of their finances in the charge of their manager, Mitsuse, who had disappeared with $2,000 without paying the theatre rent. Bailiffs charged in as they were preparing for a play and confiscated costumes, pieces of the set and anything else they could find. They had no way to pay their hotel bills and couldn't earn money without the theatre. Only one troop member could speak English and they could barely afford food, so they turned to the Japanese emigre community for help. A family offered them a place to sleep in a small room, and the whole troop crammed in with the furniture. Sada was extremely depressed and cried herself to sleep, ashamed to be reduced to begging for food. Their situation worsened until they were on the edge of starvation and had more debts. They decided another city might change their fortunes, and made the 800-mile trek to Seattle. Soon they were performing in the Seattle Theatre, and Sada was in the papers. At this point, they had to succeed or face starving to death. They managed to earn enough money to travel to Portland and then to Chicago. In Chicago, they were turned away everywhere, usually with some racist insults to boot. Once again, they had to ration food and were living on the very last of their money, trying to feed 17 people. Otojiro and Sada slept in a cramped and dingy room. This was the worst struggle they had faced yet. They could barely afford a piece of bread when they were informed the Lyric Theatre had a new, kind manager who might give them a chance, Mr. James S. Hutton. After being informed he was too busy to see them, they waited outside the theatre all day until Hutton's curiosity was piqued by their persistence. Through their translator, they explained their situation and were informed that the theatre was fully booked. However, Mr Hutton's daughter was in the room hearing their story. She loved anything Japanese, and now had the chance to see real Japanese people perform traditional theatre. And so, through the power of a daughter's influence on her father, the troupe were booked for the Sunday matinee performance. Mr. Hutton invited his artistic friends and journalists, but the actors had no money for advertisement. They were so poor they had to rely on drinking water to stop their hunger. The day before the performance, despite everyone being on the verge of collapse, they dressed up and paraded through the streets with an advertisement banner, and the next day they had a full house. Despite actors falling down and not having the strength to get back up again, and even Sada fainting while performing her dance, the audience believed it was all part of the play, and they had never seen something so exotic before. As usual, Sada's dancing proved to be the main attraction. Their first performance earned them enough money to eat properly for the first time in weeks, and it was a critical success. Mr. Hutton agreed to give the troupe $400 a week plus $2 per actor for a season of performances, and soon Otojiro and Sada were staying in the best hotel once again. They acquired an American manager who sent them on a tour, doing a couple of nights in each place, but just as their success was growing, tragedy struck. The periods of starvation and overworking the troupe had been subjected to had weakened them all. And one actor, Kurando Maruyama, collapsed and was rushed to the hospital while in Boston. 
He had contracted lead poisoning from the stage makeup he had used for years. Disfigurement and illness was common from the white powder actors and geisha used in those days. One week after he collapsed, Corando died. It was a massive blow for the troupe, but the show must go on. Under their new manager, Alexander Comstock, Sada and Otojiro were billed as the Japanese Sir Henry Irving and Ellen Terry. Otojiro had always dreamed of being taken seriously as an actor, and now he was being compared to the man who had almost single-handedly dragged theatre from the vulgar slums in the eyes of society to the height of sophistication. Boston's reserved high society flocked to the performances, and Sada in particular received glittering reviews. A Japanese antiques dealer provided them with lavish sets as a way to advertise his business. That same man helped find a Japanese doctor for Otojiro when he was struck down with appendicitis and had to rest for three weeks from surgery. Sada took the reins and juggled all her responsibilities as best she could, but soon another actor was hospitalised and sadly died. As many in the diminished troupe had, he left a family behind in Japan with the hope of making his fortune. They buried him on a hill alongside Corando. They immediately returned to their packed schedule of plays. Sir Henry Irving and Ellen Terry arrived in Boston, and unembarrassed by the comparisons made between them in the press, Otojiro and Sada went to their play and invited the famous actors to go to theirs. Soon they became good friends, and Irving wrote the troupe a letter of introduction. Sada in particular had caught the eye of other important figures, namely the Japanese ambassador Komura, who attended a performance to see what was really behind the reports of a beautiful geisha dancing in Japanese versions of Western plays. He was so impressed he invited the troupe to perform in Washington, throwing two lavish parties where a traditional Japanese stage was erected. The troupe even performed for President William McKinley. After this triumph, they travelled straight to New York and performed at the Berkeley Lyceum to an audience of high society and well-known people in the world of theatre. Sade even coached Blanche Bates, the actress playing Cho-Cho-San in a recent Broadway adaptation of Madame Butterfly. The troupe was a huge success in New York, where Sada and Otojiro received endless invitations and glittering reviews, but after a couple of months, they decided it was time to move on to London. With Sir Henry Irving's letter of introduction, they were warmly received by the Japan Society, and despite having no manager in England, were soon playing at the Coronet Theatre. Despite all the success, they still had to be careful with money, and pretended to have a lot more than they actually did. Nevertheless, they won over London with their mix of Japanese and Western theatre, and to end their stay in the city obsessed with all things Japanese, they were invited to perform at a party given in the honour of Edward, Prince of Wales. A banker who lived in Mayfair was throwing the party, and the very best of aristocratic society was in attendance. A Japanese stage had been built especially, and the troupe gave two performances from their repertoire. For the first performance, there was no applause, which worried the actors until they were told that it was simply court etiquette. For the second performance, however, the audience broke out into vigorous applause. The troupe was told that was the first time the rule had been broken. The very next day, they left for Paris, where they were to perform at the Loewy Fuller Theatre for the Paris Exposition. Fuller was an American dancer, famous for her serpentine dance, where she wore a long dress, the sides attached to canes that she wielded to make the fabric flow beautifully through the air as coloured lighting streamed down on her, creating quite the magical effect. She'd gone to Europe almost a decade before and became a talented businesswoman as well as performer. Her theatre was a main attraction at the Exposition of 1900. Its entrance, designed to look like skirts being raised, made it stand out. By this time, the Kawakami troupe had gotten used to adapting to suit the tastes of their varied audiences, and while in America they had to tone down the violence in their plays, Parisian society demanded drama and gore. Even fake blood dripping from a sword and a severed head rolling out onto the stage was not enough, and so Fuller suggested for one of the plays to include Harakiri, a custom where a samurai ended his own life with a sword in a rather horrific fashion. The French loved this gory scene so much that soon nearly every character in all the plays committed harakiri. For the audience, the Kawakami troupe's performances were a visual experience. Plot holes weren't as noticeable and dialogue was sparse and still in Japanese, so nobody noticed how out of place and historically incorrect most of these death scenes were. Sada was the main attraction and highly praised. She was always billed above her husband and made quite the impression on two young dancers. Isadora Duncan was on her first trip to Paris and was moved and inspired by Sada's performance. 
And Ruth St. Denis, who has been called the mother of modern dance and is known for her love of the East, credits Sada with inspiring this passion in her. While in France, Sada also started a kimono trend, was painted by Picasso, had a perfume named after her, and inspired the composer Debussy, all while giving three performances a day and appearing in society. The exposition drew people from all over the world and showcased cultures many had never been exposed to. Sada went to see a group of geisha who had come from Japan. They gave her the Japanese supplies the troupe was running low on, and it was probably very nice for Sada to be back in her own world, and perhaps ponder on how far she had come. Likewise, it must have been encouraging for the geisha to see one of their own achieve such admiration in the West. Soon it was time for the troupe to return to their homeland. They were reduced in numbers, had been through poverty, starvation, grief, and ultimately been a triumphant success. Sada had learned how to incorporate the traditional ways of Japanese performance with Western techniques and had fallen in love with acting. Otojiro, on the other hand, had been forced to take second place to his wife and was probably pleased when they returned to Japan, although he had achieved his dream of being taken seriously as an actor and gaining acclaim in the West. Their trip back to Japan took nearly two months and they arrived in Kobe on 1st January 1901 and were received by ecstatic crowds. There was even a band playing. They travelled back to Tokyo, where they were just as warmly received, and immediately began performing, creating plays out of their real-life Western adventures. Sada only danced in one of these new plays, and spent the rest of her time catching up with friends and family, and hurriedly organising the next tour. Some members of the Kawakami troupe had stayed behind and continued to perform in Japan. Now there was virtually no risk of failure, all the remaining 20 members would be going back to the West, plus Otojiro's five-year-old son, and a whole entourage of musicians and dressers, and even a curious theatre critic. While on the first tour, in keeping with Kabuki tradition, Onogata, male actors who play the female roles, had been used, and the Western audiences believed they were really women, and even sent adoring fan mail to the actors. This time around, however, actual women could be employed, and Sada found Geisha and her own niece-in-law Tsuru Aoki for the job. Many years later, Tsuru would be a successful actress in America and help launch the career of her husband, Sesue Hayakawa, who was one of the first Japanese movie stars in Hollywood. After a busy few months, the Kawakami troupe set off for their second tour in April and finally arrived by steamship in London in June of 1901. They were reunited with Loey Fuller and in a matter of weeks had sold out at the Criterion Theatre in Piccadilly Circus and ended up staying for longer than originally planned. After a brief appearance in Glasgow, the troupe were off to familiar Paris, where the expo had ended. Sada continued in her usual role of mother of the troupe, making sure everything ran smoothly and channeling her energies into performing and accepting what invitations she could from the many she was inundated with. Soon, the next leg of the tour took the troupe to Germany, and they were joined by the dancer Isadora Duncan. In Berlin, Sada saw her old patron Hirobu Miito again, and she and Otojiro were befriended by the imperial family's dentist. Among her many duties, Sada also had to look out for Otojiro's young son Raikichi. The kind dentist threw a party for him, where he had fun with lots of other children, and soon he could speak fluent German and interpret for the troupe. He was known as Sada's son, and the papers wrote of how adorable he was and what a talent he had when he acted and danced in the plays, despite being a child of only five. It's impressive that such a young boy, who had been abandoned by his birth mother, probably raised by servants or relatives of Sada and Otojiro, and then taken off to a foreign land all in his first half decade of life could adapt so well. The troupe performed in all the major German cities, where even kings attended their plays. Loey Fuller had mismanaged large sums of money and was always on the brink of financial failure, which she blamed on Sada. Another problem was Isadora Duncan's diva behaviour. She enthralled audiences when she did dance, but more often than not, she feigned an illness or made some excuse, only choosing the very best cities to perform in. She was a success in Vienna and went back there as the troupe continued through Eastern Europe and headed to Russia, saying she would only return for a very high price which the disgruntled Fuller could not pay. Sada became increasingly the leader of the troupe as her husband's health failed him, having never recovered fully from all of his previous illnesses. In Russia, they performed for Tsar Nicholas II, and he presented Otojiro with a diamond-encrusted watch. They were going to return to Japan via the most eastern city in Russia, Vladivostok, 
but then their contract was extended a further six months, so they moved on to Italy instead. In Rome, Sada befriended Hisako Oyama, the Japanese ambassador's wife, and taught her some geisha dances. In Milan, the composer Puccini was inspired by the emotions and style of music in the Kawakami troupe's plays, and worked what he saw into the opera adaptation of Madame Butterfly he was composing at the time. The actors continued to charm in Spain and Portugal, and eventually made their way back through France to London, where after a year of non-stop performances and an unprecedentedly tightly packed tour schedule, they were finally going home. Reality hit when Otojiro and Sada returned to Japan. Despite being the first internationally successful Japanese actors, being received and respected by the uppermost echelons of American and European society, in their homeland the couple were still seen as belonging to the lowest classes and judged as such. Otojiro was not a real kabuki actor because he had not been apprenticed by an established acting family from a young age, as was traditional. Sada was just an ex-geisha and refused to act in Japan. She could not be more popular than her husband and was not trained in kabuki either, although the public, having heard of her success, were desperate to see her for themselves. Otojiro was approaching his 40s and Sada was 31. In light of this, she wanted to build a home and bought a piece of land in the fast-developing Chigasaki area. A large house was erected, surrounded by views of Mount Fuji and the sea. She hired servants and bought an array of animals, as well as devoting the second floor of the house to raising silkworms. While Sada dreamed of a simple farm life, Otojiro remained determined to change the public perception of theatre. Just as simplified kabuki had worked in the West, Western plays held great potential in Japan. Translating Shakespeare was a start. Some of his plays had already made their way to Eastern stages. If kabuki was constrained by tradition, and new wave drama too cheap and satirical, these dialogue-rich Western plays were sure to be a hit, and, as Otojiro called them, true drama. Othello was chosen as the first play, and Otojiro and many others wanted Sada to take the role of Desdemona. At first, she vehemently refused, but eventually gave in. The audience had never seen a Western play or a woman on the stage, and yet they loved Sada's performance. Despite its six-hour length, the play was a huge success, and even had a tour of some major cities. Next, Sada enthralled audiences as Ophelia, and a real-life tragedy added depth to her performance. On 19th August 1903, Sada's adoptive mother Kamikichi died at the age of 59, leaving the woman she had raised grief-stricken. Sada's marriage and her husband's health were also declining, adding to her melancholy. Otojiro had to retire from the stage, but continued to drive the troupe forward with his ideas. Taking after the Western theatres, the Kawakami troupe cut the length of performances to four hours instead of all-day shows people were used to. They also sold tickets much cheaper and directly to the public, whereas before they had always been sold by the tea houses around theatres, and during the long plays there had been food and drink and smoking allowed, and people got up and walked about as they pleased. All that was banned. There were fixed times, fixed seats, and no smoking, eating, or drinking, and the people loved it. They also loved the modern adaptations of Shakespeare, such as the contemporary Japanese take on Hamlet called The Mousetrap. Once again, the Kawakami troupe had taken a more rigid form of theatre and mixed it into something original and ahead of their time. Now, adaptations of Shakespeare with modern clothes and plot changes to fit a recognisable world are commonplace. Theatre is seen as a moving, shifting art form with endless possibilities. But back then, the Kawakami troupe often perplexed and even provided snarky amusement for critics who thought them a joke for changing things. The Kawakami, or Sadayako troupe as they were often known, even created shows for children, another idea well ahead of its time. Just as Otojiro had found fame with the Opakepe song, which was basically a 19th century rap, now he and his troupe had pioneered a modern theatre. During the year and a half between 1904 and 1905 that Japan was at war with Russia, the Kawakamis, like everyone else, performed patriotic plays and toured to raise morale, and Sada visited hospitals. After the war ended with Russia's defeat, 6,000 prisoners of war were shipped to the tranquil island of Shikoku and forced upon the people of Matsuyama, who had no idea what to do with them, as this was Japan's first ever prisoner of war camp. They were treated with compassion and kindness by the locals, and the Kawakami troupe happened to be stopping off on tour nearby. By chance, Sada met a young Russian count who had become a great fan of hers when they had met in Russia in 1901. 
he had thrown a ball in her honour, and seeing her in Matsuyama, hugged her and expressed how glad he was to see her again. Sada arranged for him and some other prisoners to go to a nearby spa town, and she rekindled a friendship and perhaps more with this besotted man. Under guard he saw all her performances, and once again trailed by soldiers, he biked behind her carriage as she left for her next destination. Once she got there, he had sailed to her accompanied by guards, who said he had threatened to starve himself unless he could see her again. It was all very dramatic, which probably appealed all the more to Sada, and when the time finally came for him to leave for Russia through Kobe, where Sada was performing at the time, he sent her pieces of gold and a box of chocolates. In 1907, Sada returned to Paris with a group of eight to study. Among them was her niece, a translator, and another aspiring actress. By day, the women studied at the Paris Conservatoire, and every night, Sada and Otojiro attended performances. It must have been nice to watch the plays instead of putting them on, and to see Paris free from the constraints of a hectic schedule. However, news of Sada's arrival soon spread around Paris and made its way overseas. Friends and the public alike begged her to perform, and she eventually conceded, giving a few performances at events. The troupe was now known as the Sadayako Troupe, and even Otojiro began to call it so. Back in Japan, he had big plans to build his Imperial Theatre, a grand building where Japanese and Western design met. Sada was inspired by the respect and education actresses received abroad, and dreamed of creating her own school. Only a few months after her return from Paris, the Imperial Actress Training Institute opened on 15th September 1908. It was the first school of its kind in Japan. Despite the strict qualifications for admittance, 15 girls were chosen from over 100 applicants, many of whom belonged to important families. Nevertheless, a huge stigma still remained over the actresses. Sada's most successful student was Ritsuko Mori, who was the daughter of a politician. She was expelled from her college and her brother ended his own life due to the shame of her chosen career. But for many upper-class young women, it was either the stage Sada had opened up to them, or a miserable arranged marriage. The students did not have to pay a fee, but would have to pay for all their lessons if they dropped out before the two-year course was up. And if they tried to use the skills they had learned outside the Imperial Theatre, they would be fined. The Imperial Theatre was being built in Osaka, close to the school, and had some very influential backers. Two among them Sada had a history with. Her old friend, Momosuke Fukazawa, was now rich and had his own company, after years in a miserable marriage with a controlling father-in-law, who had died a few years earlier, freeing Momosuke to pursue whatever projects he wanted. Another backer was Hirobu Miito, Sada's old patron and lover, who was assassinated by a Korean freedom fighter before the theatre was finished in 1909. Ito's death only pushed Japan into annexing Korea, his assassin was executed, but remained a hero and martyr in his homeland to this day. The Imperial Theatre had its grand opening on 15th February 1910, and held enthralling performances where the tickets were by invitation only for a week after. Sada starred in numerous plays, and the theatre was an instant success, and everything Otojiro had spent his life dreaming of. Sadly, he did not get to enjoy it for long. In the autumn of 1911, his appendix began to trouble him again, and he was diagnosed with abdominal dropsy. After surgery and every attempt to restore his health, he died in his theatre on 11th November 1911. The streets of Osaka were bursting with people, and police were there to control the crowd for his funeral procession, led by Raikichi and Sada, before a train took Otojiro's body and his closest family and friends back to the Zen temple where he was buried, nearby the place he had grown up in. Widows were expected to retire from public life, cut their hair and spend the rest of their lives as nuns, or remarry. But Sada escaped this, saying it was Otojiro's dying wish for her to continue performing and taking care of the theatre. The original Kawakami troupe had splintered off in different directions over the years, but now all the surviving actors decided to reform the original troupe, with Sada as their leader and do a tour. They travelled Japan to great acclaim, but this was not the only group formed around Otojiro's death. All the geisha who had been his lovers over the years decided to form an ex-lovers club and meet every year to remember him. There were over 60 members. 
Despite all the critical success, the Imperial Theatre had cost too much money for Sada to pay back, and only a few years after its grand opening, she handed it over to the creditors, and it eventually became a branch of a bank. Otojiro's dying wish was that Sada look after his beloved theatre. Not only had she failed, but in 1913 tragedy struck when 17-year-old Raikichi disappeared, never to be seen again. It remained a mystery whether he was alive somewhere, or more likely had ended his own life, perhaps over a doomed love, or out of shame that despite his intelligence and hard work, he was still the son of a man little better in class than a beggar. The class stigma had remained despite Otojiro's achievements. Sada asked the temple where he was buried if she could put up a statue of him, and they vehemently refused because of his class and career. That same year, one of Sada's sisters ended her own life because of a love affair, and Asajiro, an original member of the Kawakami troupe and a lead actor, fell ill and mentally deteriorated before dying due to the lead in stage makeup. On top of this, the scandal in the papers and on everyone's lips was the affair going on between Sada and her old flame, Momosuke Fukuzawa. They had been together from as early as five months after Otojiro's death. Momosuke had been a great source of comfort to Sada in these difficult times. Despite the criticism, the pair were always seen together and didn't seem to care what anyone thought. Sada continued to act, starring alongside Kabuki actors, thus uniting old and new theatre for the first time in Tosca. And she also played Salome in a toned-down version of Oscar Wilde's scandalous play. The public were more critical of Sada after news of her affair broke out, and said she was too old for Salome. In only a few years, more acting schools for women had opened up, and now there were numerous talented, beautiful and young actresses to rival her. Sada, aged 46, announced her retirement in September of 1917, and did a small farewell tour with a play called Ada. She now threw all her energies into her life with Momosuke. He was attentive to his sons and grandchildren, and despite the animosity from his wife, he built her a house and always made sure she was taken care of. He also built a house for Sada that was completed in 1919. It became known as Futaba Palace for its size, with 14 rooms on the first floor alone, including a ballroom where the couple would entertain all the most important and glamorous people. Sada also needed to find a new heir now Raikichi was gone, and adopted two young relatives of Momosuke's, who were second cousins, 19-year-old Hirozo in 1918 and 13-year-old Tomiji in 1920. Tomiji and Sada adored each other, and in 1924 Tomiji and Hirozo were married. In 1930 their daughter named Hatsu was born, whom Sada doted on and became the perfect grandmother too. The twenties were a busy time for Sada and Momosuke. Sada created the Kawakami Silk Company and treated the young women who worked for her with unusual kindness for the time. Instead of being overworked, as was common, they only worked eight-hour days with breaks every hour, and afterwards were taught skills such as tea ceremony. After an earthquake destroyed most of Tokyo and the economy along with it in 1923, the silk company was closed. Momosuke was chairman of numerous businesses, and built himself and Sada a house in the once peaceful Kiso Valley to oversee the building of his and Japan's first hydroelectricity power station. Sada would ride around the village on a red motorcycle and was kind to the locals. Momosuke built a bridge in the area and the Oi Dam, which was opened in 1924 and still helps power Kyoto and Osaka today. The same year, Sada opened the Kawakami Children's Music and Drama School. Four years later, she closed it down, when Momosuke fell ill and subsequently retired. Sada always knew she was just a mistress officially, and as was traditional, as Momosuke aged, it would be time to part with him for the last time, and hand him back to his wife Fusa. In 1933, that day came, and it was the last time they saw one another. Fusa was an obstinate and headstrong woman, and despite having done very little to make her marriage a good one, she remained bitter towards her husband and refused to let him in her house. He lived in one of the other houses built on the same estate, and with his granddaughter Naomi by his side, he died in 1938. Naomi had lived with Sada and Momosuke for a time, and immediately sent for Sada, who began organising the chaos of the household in the wake of its patriarch's death. It was she, not Fusa, who did all the funeral planning. 
and yet it was unthinkable she would actually be able to attend it, so she grieved in private and did not go. She had built a temple called Teishoji Temple, and there a memorial to her lover was erected. She sold Futaba Palace, which is a museum to her in Momosuke today. During World War II, she lived at a house out in the countryside, while Tomiji and Hatsu remained in her Tokyo residence. They narrowly escaped a bombing which destroyed the city, Sada's house, photos and letters along with it. She said all that mattered was that her daughter and granddaughter were safe, and they remained at her country house for the rest of the war. They were by her side when she died, aged 75, on the 7th of November 1946. Her death received hardly any attention, as Japan had been ravaged by war and were desperately trying to recover. They had no time for things of the past. In the years to come, she and Otojiro would be consigned to a footnote at best in the history of modern theatre, and even Japanese drama. Once Westerners figured out what they had been sold as authentic kabuki on the Kawakami's two world tours was actually the furthest thing from it, there was a small outrage. But the mixing and matching of concepts, culture and interpretations of stories is commonplace today. Setting Hamlet in 1910s Japan might have been outrageous to the Shakespeare purists then, but just look at how many contemporary adaptations of classics we see today, and some would argue they make these important stories more accessible to modern audiences. Personally, I'm glad we have diversity of interpretation in theatre today, and art in general, which Sada and Otojiro played a significant role in pioneering. What do you think of this fascinating story? If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and don't forget to subscribe for more like this. Sayonara until next time.